the next thing we're going to talk about is citing. Citing is one of those tools that I think is extremely important to learn in order to be able to draw more, uh, more accurately. Um, it's, the problem with it is that it's difficult to learn. I would say this is the exercise that my students, both in group classes and one-on-one, -on -one, get the most confused by. There are a lot of moving parts to citing. There are a lot of small steps that you have to put in the right order in order to complete the big picture. So if at any point you get lost during the small steps, watch the video all the way through and then come back to the small steps once you have a thorough understanding of how they all fit together and relearn each small step because it's just a lot to take in all at once and it can get confusing. Um, the other thing is that you're really going to want to have watched the video that I made on how to make a structural line because we're gonna refer to that. We're gonna use structural line in our drawings today. Um, and so you'll wanna be familiar with that so that when I'm referring to it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, citing really is to explain how to create a, uh, an, an understanding of sizes without using math. So with citing, we're learning about proportions and proportions are just a relationship between sizes. I think the best example that I can give you is that if your favorite food is ice cream and you get served a small portion of ice cream compared to your friend's large portion of ice cream, you're actually using citing to see the difference of those visual relationships between your portions of ice cream. We use this all the time. We use it when we're packing a car to go on a road trip. Um, you're taking a look at the luggage that you have, the amount of people you're gonna have in the car, <clears throat> and the space that you're gonna have to fit those people and the luggage into the car. And then you're organizing it so that it fits the best way possible. That's taking a visual assessment and applying it to a situation. Sighting is the same thing. Um, you might have actually seen people doing it in movies, like they're holding up a paintbrush, looks romantic, maybe they're in a field. <coughs> it seems like what they're doing is just something, um, you know, not very practical, but it actually is really the best way to get your proportions accurate. The other thing that I want you to really remember is that citing is not mathematical measuring. So I don't do this with a ruler with numbers on it. I'm gonna use something like a dowel or a pencil if you don't have a dowel. Another thing that you could use, like the other day I was in a um, coffee shop and I saw those little wooden stir sticks that they have out. Those are a nice flat, straight stick. You could use something like that. <clears throat> and then we're gonna take a visual measurement of one thing and compare it visually to another thing so that we create a relationship between those sizes. We're not gonna do that with math. And the reason for that is that A, you wouldn't be able to do that if you were just comparing your ice cream to your friend's ice cream. You would need some sort of measuring device to really officially take a measurement to see that they got more than you did. And it's just not very practical. <clears throat> the other thing is that when you're doing math, it's using a different part of your brain. And it's a part of your brain that you are encouraged to develop in school and work and in our culture. And visual assessment is something that maybe is a little bit less um, commonly used. And so I think it's a great way to develop a different part of your brain. It's gonna keep you younger it's going to make you smarter, and um, everybody will benefit from learning this tool. So let's take a look at how to do that next. OK, so this part of citing that we're going to do is citing with an object at a distance. I'm going to show you a point of view camera where you can actually see what it is that I'm seeing if my object is out in front of me. And what I want you to remember is that citing in this way is a little bit more difficult. It's difficult, first of all, because when you're not measuring on your actual object, your object will appear smaller. Remember, it's not getting smaller as it moves far away from you. It just looks smaller as it goes back in space. And that's really the first rule of perspective, that things that move back in space appear smaller. Um, the other reason that this is a little bit more difficult is that I'm going to teach you how to hold your dowel or your pencil as your measuring stick. 
Your arm is really unsteady, and you're going to see that in the camera, that even my arm is really unsteady when I'm making measurements. So that makes it a little bit more difficult than when you're measuring right on the actual physical object. Don't worry, I'm going to try to guide you step by step on how to do that. So if you get confused at any point throughout the process, just go back and watch it again, and then try to apply it separately. Um, Remember that we're always going to be taking two measurements. One measurement, when you're just visually measuring, really doesn't tell you anything about anything. Think of it like if you were a three-year-old and you had no idea what inches or centimeters were, you wouldn't know that three inches is much shorter than six inches because you have no context for those measurements. It's the same thing if I take a measurement on an object <clears throat> and I don't compare it to something else, it's, if it's a visual measurement, I have no real understanding of what that size means. So it's by comparing the two relationships together, creating a proportion, that you're going to be able to understand each measurement more. The other thing is that um, this can be a little bit difficult because when you're measuring with the object far away from you and that object looks smaller, your sighting measurements are going to actually appear smaller than the drawing. Remember that your sighting measurements can be a smaller scale as long as you're creating a relationship between the measurements on your small scale sighting measurement. You can create the same relationship on your page with a larger scale drawing. Um, the other last reason that this is really difficult is that if you move yourself, like if I start hunching, um, if I move my arm in the socket at all, or if I move the table, or my chair, or the object, any of those variables can change my measurements. So there are so many variables that this makes it a really difficult process. You just have to be very mindful and present and aware of how you're taking your measurement, and then be consistent throughout all of your measurements so that everything works together in a system. Um, next, I'm going to show you actually how to do some of the different steps. So follow along. We're going to get to the next part. OK, so for this next step, I'm going to show you how to get started um, with a drawing before we do any of the sighting. Uh, you can go to this link here for my structural line um, video, and that's going to help you uh, get some more practice with this. You could also look back at the gesture, how to draw a gesture drawing video. Um, because both of those are really an important step in planning your drawing so that you have some plans on the page to compare your measurements to once you take your sighting measurements. So I'm going to be drawing this cup here. And it's a really simple cup. It's straight sided. It's got a small opening. Um, and it's pretty, pretty straightforward. What I'm going to do is, from this point of view, I'm going to look and see what the height of this is, what I'm guessing the width of it is, and then what the depth looks like. Now remember, your depth on the page is going to translate to a different height because there is no depth on a flat drawing. So I'm going to just take a guess with my structural lines that that's the width, that this is the height. And you can see I am not the best at drawing straight lines. So usually I have to make some changes. Um, I don't care if my lines are perfect. I don't care if I made some mistakes. If the mistakes are distracting, I'll erase them once I've made the corrections. But I'm not usually worried about it. Um, I make a lot of mistakes in my drawing, and it doesn't really distract from what I'm doing. So then I'm going to take my best guess at what I think this height is here. And um, I'm holding the object here so you can see it. But in a minute, you're going to see the distance that I'm actually seeing it from in my studio. And I'm going to guess that that's about the height that this depth is going to be. Um, remember that your, um, your box has to be consistent with your measurement. So when I take my measurement, I want my measurement to be from the height here to the height here, and then from the height at the center of the front of the box and then at the width of the box. So whatever my box is that I've drawn, my structural guidelines on the page, whatever that is, 
I need my measurements to be the same. There are a couple of different ways that you could create this object. You could do one length that's just the front curve, and then one length that's actually the depth in terms of your structural line boxes and your measurements. You could do one length that's from the bottom of the front curve to the midway point, and then draw the extra curve outside of the box. Or you could draw one length and measure one length that would fit both the top opening, so the depth, and the front curve. You can see that those curves are about the same height all the way across. The bottoms are about the same height all the way across. But the way that I'm measuring and drawing my structural boxes are very different. All three of these options work. You just want to make sure that in your drawing, it, that it's the same way that you do the drawing as the way that you're doing the measurement. If you measure one way and draw another way, usually you're going to wind up with some inconsistencies that make your proportions inaccurate in the end. OK, so next, I'm going to show you how to hold your dowel so that you can take those sighting measurements. And then we'll apply it to the page. OK, this next step, I'm going to walk you through how to hold the dowel. Or if you don't have a dowel or a measuring stick, what I recommend is using a pencil like this that has a really flat back to it, like my ebony pencil does. Whereas my Derwent pencils, they have that domed end of the pencil. It makes it a little bit harder to use that as an edge for measuring. I never want to use the point of my pencil, because if I use the point of my pencil and then I draw with it, that's actually a moving target. It's changing all the time. So it makes it really difficult to get an accurate measurement. This is why I usually invest in one of those little packets of wooden dowels. You can get them at a craft supply store, and they're usually just a couple bucks for like 10 or 20 of them. And that way, if some of them are a little bit bent or wonky, or if they get grungy or broken or stepped on or whatever, you have extra ones around. So I'm going to show you how to use this dowel. And the best way for me to do that is to actually turn sideways from the camera. So I'm going to turn here a little bit. <coughs> um, I want to, first of all, make sure that I hold my arm out perfectly straight. So you can see that if I were to measure, and I'm looking at something in front of me, and I hold my arm bent, and then I turn and draw, and then I try to go hold my arm out in the same spot. If it's bent, I don't know exactly where it was. If I have a locked elbow, then I have a better sense of where my dowel was in relationship to the object. So my measurements are going to be more consistent from measurement to measurement with drawing in between. The other thing is that you really want to pay attention to your posture. And I've been slouching over a drawing table for the last 20 years. So it's something that I try to pay attention to anyways, because I'm trying to sit up straighter so that I'm not one of those hunched over people when I'm older. Um, and I want to pay attention to where my shoulder is in my shoulder socket. If I really stretch my arm out, you can see that that's going to be a different relationship between the dowel and the object versus if I have it back in the shoulder socket. Likewise, I also really want to pay attention to how I'm holding my wrist. If I'm holding my wrist like this, my dowel is uh, angled. That's going to make this actually a longer measurement than if my dowel is perfectly vertical. So I usually wind up kind of tweaking my wrist in a funny way so that <laughs> my dowel can be perfectly straight up and down. And all the time when I'm walking around a classroom, I see students like this. And I'm moving their dowel like this to make sure that it's perfectly vertical, or as vertical as you can imagine from this point of view. It's hard to see from that point of view if it's vertical or not. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to close one eye. And usually we have one dominant eye that works a little bit better than others. Um, you might have to experiment back and forth to see which one works better for you. You can't keep both eyes open, though, because then you have stereo vision, and your object's going to be being seen from two different angles. You have to just look with one eye so that you can actually line up the top of your dowel with the top of the object, and your finger, or thumb in this case, with the bottom of the object. <coughs> OK, so I'm going to hold up. You can also see that I'm using this other arm. I usually line it against my rib cage and use it as a crutch to brace my arm, because otherwise my arm tends to wobble a little bit. The trick is with this is that if I'm leaning this arm up against my rib cage, 
I have to hold my breath. If I'm not holding my breath every time I take a breath, my arm is gonna raise up and lower down when I let my breath out. So I'm gonna hold my breath, close one eye, and line up the top of my dowel with the top of the object, and my thumb with the bottom of the object. So that's how you walk through that step by step. Now let me show you that with the camera so that you can see my dowel in front of the object and see what it is that I'm seeing. Okay, so now that we're looking at my point of view camera, you guys can see what I'm looking at and I'm gonna hold up my dowel here. You're gonna see that while I'm talking, my dowel is gonna wiggle around a lot, even when I'm trying to hold it really still. You're gonna see that while I'm talking, my hand is gonna move just incrementally there. Do you see how it's hard for me to actually line it up perfectly? So when I actually take my measurements, I'm gonna have to stop breathing. <laughs> well, not stop breathing, but hold my breath for a second um, just so that I can quick take my measurement. But the first thing I'm gonna do is I usually look for measurements that are similar to each other. Now, when we're looking at this cup, I have this little um, uh, cardboard cylinder here for us to look at. And when we're looking at it, most of us are going to assume that the height and the front of the curve is significantly longer than the width of the curve. However, when I hold my dowel up here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna line up the very top of my dowel here with the front part of the top of the curve at the lowest point of the height. So I'm not gonna measure it over here on the side. That's a little bit harder for me to do. I'm gonna measure it at the lowest point Sometimes what I actually do is I go for that midway point um, that is partway right at the height of the widest point of the curve. So it's not lined up with the front of the um, curve. Instead, it's a little bit above. But for this, this one, I'm gonna do it from the very front here. And now you're gonna see that I'm gonna line up the top of my dowel with that. And with my thumb, now I'm going to measure where the end of the front bottom of the curve is. So here, let me hold my breath for a second. Okay, so that's about as accurate as I think I can make it. And you can see, you have to take these measurements with a grain of salt, they're not perfect. There's no way that we can get our hand and our eye and the object to coordinate perfectly all at the same time. Once I have that measurement as close as I think I can get it, I'm gonna hold that measurement and rotate my hand and line it up with the width as best as I can. And now we're in for a surprise because we thought that height was so much longer than the width, but when you see where the dowel is on <clears throat> the widest point of the curve, let me hold my breath again here, you can see that the height is just a smidge wider than the widest point of the curve. So they're almost equal. So there you have a nice relationship that you've created. The width is about as wide as the height is. Um, <coughs> let's take a different measurement. So let's look at something that's even harder to measure. Um, I'm gonna measure the opening of the cup right here, and I'm gonna compare it to the height so that I can see the relationship between those two. So I'm gonna have to hold my breath here and I'm gonna line up my dowel with the middle point of that curve of the opening of the cup. And that's about as accurate as, as I can get. You can see that the smaller the measurement is, the more difficult it is to get accurately. And now I'm going to compare that to the height from the top of the curve to the bottom of the curve right here. And <laughs> the way that I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna lower this, I'm gonna hold that measurement, lower the dowel, I'm gonna count one, and I'm gonna pick a marking spot right about here where I think it ends visually. And then I'm gonna lower my thumb down again, two. I'm gonna pick a marking spot again it's just above where the table meets the background. And I'm running into a problem where my dowel is hitting the table. So I don't know 
know if I'll be able to do this here. There's two. Let's try that again. One, two, three, four. My guess is about four of the openings in length fits into the front side. So now we're gonna look on the page and we're gonna check those relationships where we have the height compared to the front and the front compared to the width. So we're gonna check that on our page next. Okay, so now we've seen how my measurements actually look on the object. And what I wanna show you next is how do you take that information and actually apply it to your drawing? So let's go back to the page. Remember I had done these structural line drawings where I had guessed the width in relationship to the height and the depth. I'm gonna erase these lines here so that they're out of your way because I think they're gonna get confusing. Um, and then remember the relationship that we created in our minds. There was a ratio that we created between the height and the width. Let's start there and I'm gonna check on my object. So remember that the relationship was that the length was just slightly longer than the width. You had a tiny little measurement of the length and the width. You've drawn something that's much bigger. So remember your sighting is always a smaller measurement because it's taken on an object that's farther away. And then your structural line is representing the object that's life size, so it's gonna be larger. But the ratio between the two can be the same. So I had a ratio in my smaller measurement of almost one to one. Now I want a ratio in my larger measurement of almost one to one. So this is how I do that. I'm gonna line up my dowel here with the width and with my thumb, just like I did on the object, I'm gonna measure the width. I'm gonna hold it and compare that now. Let's see, I'm gonna move some of these things out of the way so that you can see it better. <clears throat> so I've got my measurement here. I've held it steady. Now I'm gonna compare it and do you see when I line that up here, I have just a little bit of extra length on my guess that was on my structural line box. So I was just taking my best educated guess there and that's an accurate ratio or proportion and relationship of the sizes that I had taken on my sighting of my object. Let's look again at the top here. Remember that I had determined that four of those depths could fit into the height. So I'm gonna take a pencil in my wrong hand and then I'm gonna measure one, two, three, four. Now I've got four plus a little extra and that's not the same measurement that I had gotten when I was doing my sighting on the object. There are two solutions. I could make this one shorter, but if I do that, that's gonna change its relationship to the width. And I don't wanna do that because I had already determined that that relationship between the width and the length was accurate. So my other option then is to not change the height of the front of the object but to add a little bit of depth. And remember your depth is translated to height on the page. So I'm gonna put in my new line first. Remember that's my helper line. I'm gonna erase my old line and then I'm going to remeasure. So I made the fix. Let's see, and remember it's just my best guess. Let's do this too, let's erase these tabs here so that they won't get confusing. Okay, so now I'm gonna take this measurement again and now I'm gonna measure it to see if four of those make up the height of the front of the object. Sometimes it's a case where now I've gone too big and I have. Look at that. This is what I call the Goldilocks rule of drawing. I've got a video on that one too. So 
you can follow along with that. It's often the case that we go from something that's too small to something that's too big. When the third time, it's gonna be just right. So I'm gonna put it right in the middle. I can see my old line. I think my pencil might be breaking. <clears throat> Sometimes with a softer lead pencil like this one, they break pretty quickly. Okay, let's erase those and try again. And hopefully the third time's the charm. So there's one, two, three. It's getting closer. It's still a little smidge too big, but that's what I call close enough. So now this relationship between the depth, which is translated to a height, and the front height of the curve, which is this part, that's accurate. And then the height is now accurate in relationship to the width. So my proportions are now accurate because of the sighting that I've did, that I did, <laughs> that I've done. <laughs> um, hopefully that's gonna help you guys out. Remember that sighting is really confusing. There are a lot of steps that you have to put together. Um, the steps in isolation don't usually make sense, so you have to put it all together into the whole. It's just like drawing, lots of small parts making up the whole, and then it's gonna make for a much more accurate drawing. Um, let me know if you guys have any questions, and I've got more exciting videos coming on the way. Thank you all so much for watching. More videos are coming soon, so if you wish to subscribe to my channel, go ahead and do that. And also you can check out my website, lzmstudio.com.